he reaches out his hand of grace to lift us up from whatever may be paralyzing our lives so that we can walk and jump and dance in newness of life before him. The temple in Jerusalem. During the time of the early Christian church was an impressive architectural wonder. With an entryway comprised of four segregated courts. Gentiles were limited to the outermost court, which for obvious reasons was called the court of the Gentiles. Jewish women could go one step further into the court of the women. However, only Jewish men could go into the third court called the court of the Israelites. And finally, there was the innermost court of the priests, where, of course, only the priests could enter, and where the altar of, in, of, of sacrifice was located. The gate called Beautiful connected the outermost court of the Gentiles with the next court of the women. But as with everything else about that temple, it was anything but ordinary. It was 60 feet wide. It was so massive that the Jewish historian Josephus tells us it took 20 men to close it. But it wasn't just enormous, it was also magnificent. We don't have a picture of what it looked like back then, but it was probably covered in gold and other precious metals. If this one gate was so beautiful that it was called by that name, we can only imagine how breathtaking the temple must have been. Well, ironically, against this backdrop of this impressive, breathtaking temple lay a poor, paralyzed man, a beggar over 40 years of age. Most men in their 40s were probably married with children successful in their chosen careers. But not this man. Paralyzed from birth, he was unable to work, and so he probably didn't have a wife and children or a profession by which to earn a living. All he could do was to lay beside that beautiful gate, that gate called beautiful, to beg for a few coins to sustain his pitiful existence. Peter and John were two of Jesus' closest friends on earth. And apparently they continued in that relationship even after he ascended to heaven. And so it came as no surprise that they decided one day to go to the temple together. Perhaps they were looking for an opportunity 
to share the gospel with someone. We don't know for sure. What we do know was that it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. A traditional time of prayer for Jews. But for Christians, it meant even more. Because 3 p.m. was the time that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. It was around that time that the veil in the temple was ripped in two by an unseen hand allowing access to the most holy place through the ministry of Christ. You see, 3 p.m. meant a lot to Christians like Peter and John. But as they came up to this gate called Beautiful, they encountered this paralyzed man begging for a few coins, just a few coins. Perhaps they had passed him many times before, but this time was different. Somehow, they sensed the Spirit of God prompting them to stop and help this man. And when they did, they saw a man whose self-esteem was so low that he couldn't even bring himself to look into their eyes. And so Peter had to say to him, look at us. Look at us. Slowly, the man lifted his gaze, hoping to see an outstretched hand with some coins in it. But instead, all he saw were two men who were almost as poor as he was. Silver and gold I do not have, Peter said. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Walk! I'm somewhat amused when I read this because it hints to me how inexperienced Peter was with this sort of thing. You see, Jesus knew how to do this. When he healed the crippled man by the, by the pool of Bethesda, he didn't just say to him, walk. He said to him, get up. And then he said, walk. Peter was impatient. He wasn't concerned with those details. He just wanted to get to the meat of it all. And so he skipped all that other stuff and he just said, walk. We already know that this man was born paralyzed. He had never even stood on his feet before, much less walked. And so he probably didn't know what to do with Peter's command. All he had asked for were a few coins 
to sustain his pitiful existence. This wasn't the response he expected. He was so confused. But as he sat there trying to understand what had just happened, Peter reached out his hand and grabbed the beggar's hand and pulled him up on his feet. I wonder, as Peter pulled that beggar up, whether his mind flashed back to that dark, lonely night on the Sea of Galilee, as he was sinking beneath the waves and how Jesus came to him and reached out his hand to pull him out of a watery grave. By the way, when was the last time you extended a helping hand to someone in need? As Christians, we are not called to condemn sinners. Did you hear me? We are not called to condemn sinners. Because the Bible says that Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Rather, he came to save it. And so as Christians, we are called to be Christ's hands. To lift others up who have been crippled, abused, and enslaved by sin so that they too can walk in newness of life with him. And so as Peter extended his hand to pull that beggar up, the healing power of God surged into those paralyzed legs and suddenly a man who had never walked before in his life began walking and jumping and, dare we say, dancing in newness of life before God. Without a doubt, he was a new man. In fact, the Bible says that his friends who knew him were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. But here's my question for you, friends. Whose faith healed this man? Was it the beggar's faith that healed him? I don't think so. He probably didn't have any faith in Jesus. Perhaps he didn't even know him. In fact, all he asked for were a few coins to sustain his pitiful existence. You see, it was ultimately Peter's faith that awakened this beggar to the possibility of a life in Christ that he never thought possible before. In other words, when Peter reached out to lift this man up, he wasn't just extending a helping hand. Rather, he was also extending a hand of faith. What? You see, friends, salvation can never be earned. It is a gift of grace from God through faith in Jesus. 
But even that faith comes from God through Jesus. He is the one who gives us the ability to believe. But this is where we sometimes misunderstand that because salvation is entirely God's work, that there is nothing we have to do. The Bible clearly tells us otherwise. And Peter said as much to the crowd of people who were gathered around that healed beggar, saying, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. You see, while the Bible says that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation, there is something we must do to receive it. And that is to repent and turn to God. Friend, I am not here to condemn you. I am not here to judge you. Rather, I am here to invite you to come to Jesus so that he can do what only he can do to save you. For some, that may mean allowing him to be first in your life. For others, it may mean confessing an addiction that is undermining your spiritual relationship with him. For still others, it may mean trusting him to care for you even as you deal with the trials and tribulations of your life. And yet, despite our best efforts, we ultimately fall short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul expressed the futility of it all as he confessed the struggles of his own spiritual life. He said, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In my inner self that is in my mind, I delight in God's law but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? As the prophet Jeremiah once observed, can an Ethiopian change his skin? Or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. On the night before he was crucified, while he was in the garden with Peter, James, and John, Jesus taught his disciples how to withstand temptation. He said to them, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. 
It sounded simple enough. Just watch and pray. How difficult can that be? And yet the disciples fell asleep in the garden at the very moment that Jesus needed them most. Despite their best intentions, they were powerless to change themselves. You see, friends, ultimately repentance is not about fixing ourselves. Because we're incapable of that. Rather, it is about confessing our utter helplessness against sin and humbly turning to God. That's what the prodigal son did when he finally realized that there was nothing he could do to fix the mess he had created. All he could do was to repent and return to his father. In the end, friends, that is all you and I can do with our messed up lives. Like the beggar by the gate called beautiful, we don't even know what we need. And so we ask for a little more money, a few more blessings from the hand of God to sustain our pitiful existence on this earth. When what Jesus wants to do is to heal our broken lives. You see, friends, only when we admit that we are nothing but beggars in this life. Only when we come to him in humility and repentance. Can the faith that comes through Jesus become our own. But as we come to him in that faith, as we place our trust in Jesus, and even as we struggle to obey his commands, he reaches out his hand of grace to lift us up from whatever may be paralyzing our lives so that we can walk and jump and dance in newness of life before him. Some of you here listening to my voice today may be sick, perhaps even to the point of death. Others of you may be struggling with bankruptcy or deep debt, and are struggling to make ends meet. Still others of you may be enslaved by an addiction that is destroying your lives, but you don't know how to break free. Friend, I don't know what you're struggling with in your life today, but I do know this. There is healing in the name of Jesus. And so I invite you today to come to him, to repent and turn to God so that he can lift you up from whatever is paralyzing your life so that in the end you can say to him with all your heart all I have to offer you is what I have received 
from your gracious hand of mercy since I first believed. Tokens of my gratitude are only just a start. Jesus, I am here to offer you